So I want to introduce what the, uh, our, the executive vice president, of, uh, Dr. Dr. Will Carson, and uh, please give me a big welcome. <laughs> Dr. Will Carson will introduce how the panel of this uh, one at a time and uh, can I pass to the ball to you? Great, <laughs> thank right. you. You're welcome. I'll introduce them right after I sing some Bon Jovi. Okay. Uh, it is a thrill for me to have these guys here. Hopefully this will be an opportunity for all of us to just glean from uh, the wisdom and insight of of those who are walking in and who have walked uh, through the experience of, of just being Christ's ambassadors in the workplace and for them to share a little bit of insight from their own experience uh, what that looks like and hopefully uh, it will give you an opportunity as well as, as they're talking and sharing a bit of their story for you to be thinking about the questions that you might have as you're heading into what's it look like for me to be a Christ follower in the workplace, uh, regardless of your, the discipline that you will go into or regardless of the location that you'll be in, you know, in your community, in your workplace, uh, with your family, what does that look like for you to live that out, to be a critical participant uh, in a contemporary world? And so I'm very thankful for their willingness to, to be here and to share with us some of their insights uh, and how uh, God has led in their life. I will briefly introduce them, but part of what they're going to be doing is sharing some of their story, and so I'll allow them to introduce themselves. But Todd Hunt uh, is owner of uh, Lift a Lot uh, Company, and he's a board member here at uh, Spring Arbor University. Then Will Davis, uh, he is author of Creating a Culture of Excellence, a book that I would recommend to you for reading. I uh, read it a couple of months ago uh, on an airplane trip that I was taking and really gleaned from that his passion and really uh, his desire to, to use and to, to call out who we are uh, within his company, who has Christ created you to be. And so recognizing the value of uh, human capital and and who each person is individually and the strengths that they bring to the workplace. But he lives in Muncie, Indiana. And then Matt, uh, who you met this morning through chapel, uh, and the pastor uh, of the church there, and just the gifted speaker that he is. But I'll turn it over to them uh, to introduce themselves, to share portions of their story with you. And then, again, we're going to have some time for question and answer. And so be thinking of ways that you want to engage them. Will, go ahead. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having us, number one. Thanks for all of you for showing up. It's really awkward to go into a room like this and have the table up here and nobody's out there. So uh, very much appreciate you taking that off our table for us. Um, thanks, uh, Dr. Ellis, for having us. With just a tremendous place you guys call your academic home here for a few years. And I'm very impressed with the first time I've been to campus, but it's an awesome place. So uh, congratulations on that. Um, I'm supposed to, the way the structure was, I think handy. Now I'm supposed to kind of make some introductory comments and thoughts, but Todd follow up, but Matt uh, tells you what you should have heard in the first place. And, uh, and then we're going to just open up for questions. So as you think of things, as we're talking, feel free to write them down and make a note to yourself to be sure and ask us later. I don't think any of us have any questions that we'll consider out of bounds, so uh, bring them. Um, I'm a PK. Any other PKs or MKs in the room? Yeah, so uh, this whole thing about going into uh, a Christian vocation is something that uh, among the many, many voices that you're tempted to hear when you're growing up, one that becomes almost indistinguishable from your own oftentimes is, in fact, your parents. And so my dad is a pastor, and what does that imply that my dad believed the highest and best use of a person's life could possibly be? Well, I took it right away. It had to be in pastoral ministry. I don't know if any of you have suffered from that illusion or not, but I thought it was surely you had to be in pastoral ministry or, or be willing to go to Africa or someplace to actually be in missional type of work like that. And there was only one really dynamic problem with that, which was that I didn't feel called into that. Now, my dad would go back and say, he spent 60 years in pastoral ministry, by the way. He would go back and say, you know, 
I, I knew that I was supposed to do that. I'm absolutely, positively, for sure it. And I really wrestled with that. And I went to school and didn't know what I was going to do, so I changed majors a hundred times. Um, and just finally took a job at the Computer Center at Ball State and found out I love computers and parlayed that and a business minor into a job as an accounting supervisor in a bank, believe it or not. Uh, where I did that for three years, went to work at General Motors for three years after that, where General Motors at the time was ushering many of my computers onto the shop floor. We were doing things that really computers weren't made to do at that point in time. Uh, so we had this wonderful immersion education experience on sink or swim, make it work, and count those parts as they sit by on the monorail with a computer. And uh, that was, it was really challenging, really fun, and I felt like I was learning a really valuable skill, but I didn't feel what my dad would have called a sense of calling about that. Had the opportunity to uh, partner with a guy who's a, an en another engineer, software engineer with me, uh, to start a business based on software, and that, that business became Ontario Systems. Uh, I just retired from there about five years ago. I'm still the chairman of that company. Um, and that idea for me of building a business where people were treated ethically, people were treated with respect, something that was kind of foreign to the work I'd had at General Motors. Even though General Motors, we call them generous motors because the pay and the compensation were so good. It was a very debilitating place to work for me because human capital turned out not to be valued very much. And so the opportunity to create a place where people were valued, where I felt like I and everyone I worked with had a chance to become everything God created them to be, was really important. So as you are in this process of choosing for yourself a life vocation, or whatever you're going to do and look back on, you're going to go to your 10th year class, uh, high school class for you and say, what are you doing? They say, well, I'm doing this, or whatever it is. Um, I want you to notice one thing about the two words that we most commonly use to describe that. Uh, one is the word profession. What's your profession? The word profess, profess, is to, profess is to speak. Pro is before. What are, you, what are you speaking before you about your life with what you do with it? The question Matt asked us more articulately this morning. The second word I'll call your attention to is the word vocation. That word, that word comes from the same root word as your vocal, word for vocal, vocabulary. It literally means to call. When we speak about what we're going to be doing with our lives, the challenge is, I think, to figure out what we are called to do, our unique gifts, talents, abilities, experience, and passions. What are we called to do uniquely and to find satisfaction in that as a believer? I think you have to figure out how to align that with what God calls us to be as human beings. So that's the basic challenge in life, figure out your vocation. And I, the other thing I will say is, before I hand it to Todd, I'll tell him about his journey as well. For me, this has not been a one, once, once, once the decision is made, it's made forever. For me, it's been a kind of constant process of discovery <coughs> and learning. And uh, I, I admire Tony Dungy on lots of levels, not the least of which is I'm a Colts fan. And he does good things for us. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, Tony Dungy says, he says, you know, we spend our most of our lives we spend looking for our career. We should be looking for our purpose. Finding your purpose, let your career come out of purpose. That's a much healthier way and more deeply satisfying way to live than to do the opposite way around. So that's what we're here today to kind of share with you about our experiences, how that works for us. And again, please feel free to think of the questions. Let me introduce my friend Todd Hunt. Thank you. Um, as Doug said, uh, I own a company called Lift a Lot. Yeah, close. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you about that later. I also have a couple other companies up here in Michigan in the machining industry. Um, I, I, this is the first time I've ever had a chance to talk to students, so I'm used to, I, I've only screwed my kids up so far, so I'm <laughs> say I screw somebody else's kids. So bear with me on that. But I do have something that, you know, that I want to clearly articulate today, and I'll try to be brief about it. It's something that, that weighs on my mind a lot. So what, is it, what does it mean to be uh, Christ-like in the business world, which is, which is where I'm coming from? So if you're not a business major, I apologize, but just hear me out. Let me tell you what, in my mind, what it doesn't mean to be uh, uh, Christ-like in the business world. Uh, it doesn't mean to me that uh, you, you uh, settle for less. It doesn't mean to me that you, uh, that you uh, somehow you're a victim. Um, 
the world today, in my opinion, I, I own small businesses, so I'm very hands-on, and uh, we are, we're, my business are manufacturing, so we're moving product, we're moving material, we're moving people, and, and uh, it, it, is a, it is a vicious world out there. And uh, if you don't think that it's competitive, um, we were talking on the way up here, take a drive down to places like the University of Chicago, where I have some people that I know that go. There are people from all over the world competing for the jobs that you guys are going to be competing for, and they don't care about any of the things that you care about. Trust me. So, what what it what it means to be uh, Christ-like in business today for me is that we have to absolutely be the best that we can. There are, in, in places like Spring Arbor University, yeah, I'm partial, I'm on the board, and I've got some history here, but places like Spring Arbor, Spring Arbor University are being threatened for their existence and will continue to be. And if people like you, these young people, don't go out and succeed in the secular world and absolutely live the concept, I know it gets a little old, maybe it's cliche, but absolutely be relevant in a contemporary world, we're in trouble. And along with that does come making money and, and, and all those things. And for me, uh, that's when the rubber really meets the road, is, is to be contemporary but live within the framework of who we were called to be. And in business today, it isn't getting any easier. And so you will be challenged on character and value and honesty and all the things that, that, that you were raised with. That we're challenged every day with them. And you'll have opportunities to, to, to make the right decisions. But you, but the higher you go in your career and the more successful you are in the secular world, you'll be challenged more and more. But that's where we're called to be. Let me, let me put this way. That's where I felt I was called to be. And um, so uh, <coughs> relevancy in the world today is a big, big deal. And if People, if young kids like Spring Arbor University that go to Spring Arbor University aren't out there slugging it out, succeeding, and being an absolutely visible example of what it's like to be Christ-like, then places like this are, are irrelevant. And that's sad. So I don't mean to be uh, negative in any way. But I, I, I really believe that today is an opportunity for me to be uh, relevant. Tell you like it is. <clears throat> Tell you that there's fewer jobs out there, fewer careers out there. There's few. Generous Motors doesn't exist anymore. Will is right. That's what it was. I grew up in Lansing, Michigan, right up the street. I know all about Generous Motors. Ain't there anymore. And so you're gonna you're gonna be called and. You're going to be challenged to do things uh, that are tangible and real. And that, if you succeed, will give you an opportunity to be a demonstration of what Christ is. I deal with people every day that talk about Christ and talk about character and talk about honesty. I deal with very few that actually carry it out in real meaningful ways. I don't mean that, oh, hey, I, you know, some guy dropped a nickel so I picked it up and gave it to him. I mean, Stuff that maybe hurts their pocketbook themselves, but they make the right decisions. You know, taking less because it's the right thing to do. So that's kind of my story. I don't know if I if I, if I led you astray or not, but uh, be happy to answer any questions. Matt, you know well. Um, you've heard him speak a couple times now. If you've been around, he is the pastor of mine at Will's Church, and I'm going to turn it over to him. Thanks, Todd. Yeah, I'm Matt. I don't own any companies or businesses. Uh, um, uh, you guys kind of got me thinking. Uh, we're Ball State University, for, like right now, from our church, and it's you know, a big state school or whatever. And I can't tell you how many times I've I've talked to students who have gone through four years of school and they're, they've majored in elementary education or business or whatever it is, and then they kind of have these conversations like. I think I'm gonna not do that, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go into ministry. 
And usually what they're referring to is some campus, you know, Campus Crusade or University of Navy or whatever. All great, all great ministries doing great things. But every time that happens, I'm just like, it, there's something there that's implied that what they were going to do was not ministry, is what they're saying. And I'm not saying that maybe they shouldn't do that. Maybe, you know, God, I'm a pastor. I'm in what's traditionally, you know, vocational ministry. But I think that language, and, and I've noticed it, moving away from it a little more I've noticed in the last 10 years, but that language still comes up, like I'm, I'm going to go do ministry. And I, when I know people well and I feel like it's not rude, I want to stop and say, when they talk about pastors or missionaries as, you know, as ministry, I, I stop and say, you don't, really, you don't really mean that, right? I mean, you think of what you're doing as full-time ministry as well. And I, I know we need a word for it. I think the word is vocational ministry. Regardless of the words you use, I think what you mean is the important thing. And so I just want to encourage you that are going into non-vocational ministry fields, um, that that is part of your calling, that that is, you are called to full-time ministry. It's just, it's your family, and it's, it's the work that God's given you to do, and it's all these things. And the other thing I want to say, jumping off of what Todd said, I read a really good book lately called um, Culture Making by Andy Crouch. He was the former chaplain at Harvard. And he talks about culture and how culture has changed. And, you know, we all want to go out and change the world kind of thing. And he, it's, I highly recommend this, it's coming from that. Um, he talks about how culture, there, it, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. Culture expands to fill all the available space. And so, for example, every, every language has a word to describe everything its speakers experience, you know. We all see the color spectrum differently, but every, every language has a, color for every, a word for every color people see. Um, so there's no vacuum of culture, which means, I think this is a huge insight, to change culture you have to push something else out. You have to actually expand into that space. And so people aren't just saying, you know, we're dying for you to come fill this cultural gap. And so to do that, it means you have to do the work of cultivating well, which is what essentially Todd is saying. That means you have to know your field. You have to know what it is that you're the, the, the screenwriter who writes an amazing screenplay has first watched a thousand movies. If, you see what I'm saying? The, the surgeon who comes up with a new technique has first performed a thousand routine surgeries. The investor who invests in the next great company has already read a thousand balance sheets and, and on and on. You know, and, he goes. Um, and so I just want to give you permission, I think that's part of our calling, to cultivate well where we are. Because then we have an opportunity, once you've done that, to actually bring something new to life or to speak change uh, because you've, you've done the work of cultivating. So. As we head into Q&A time, Will, I would like for you to talk a little bit about how is the company that you created different? And maybe talk about some of the principles that are in the book, but, but creating a culture of excellence. So from any other software company, what is it that made you different in the way that you went about doing that? I think that the, uh, those of you who are in business, you'll understand that uh, your, whatever your business philosophy is, a lot of it gets codified, made into a policy, the way you, your corporate culture begins to feel. A lot of that happens through your HR policies and procedures. So uh, it begins with selection. And in my view, whoever you, let me quote Peter Drucker, you have four tools as a manager. You're talking to business people and, and, and pastors. You have four, four tools as, a, as managers. You have the power to select. In, in my view, you, the company becomes who you select. It's the most important thing you do. You have the power to appoint to positions. So Jim Collins words for this would be get the right people on the bus and get them in the right seats on the bus. How are you going to organize them? You two, first two. Third tool you have as a manager, meetings. And meetings should have an agenda. They should have a purpose. They should be uh, well run. And the fourth thing you have is reports. You should be able to not have a meeting if a report will do. And those are in the order of power. Your highest power ones, who you actually hire. The second one's how you play them, what organizations are. Third one is what your meetings do for you. And the fourth one is reports, reports being weakest. Those are also in inverse proportion how often you should use them. You should use reports frequently. You should use meetings less frequently. You should do corporate reorganizations less frequently, and you should only hire when you absolutely need them. And so one of the things we can do to compromise ourselves is if we use any of those tools inappropriately, I have a good friend who runs a really good business, 
uh, well-intentioned, but they sabotage their witness by reorganizing constantly, which means nobody knows exactly what to expect. And so we have to be careful how we use those tools. If those are the four tools you have, selection is the most important one. How you hire people. So when we hire people, we don't really hire skills. I mean, people are going to school to get a lot of skills. We actually hire character. And we figure we're going to have to train them in the skills they're going to need anyway for our unique environment, our unique industries we serve. So we don't wonderfully find both, but most of the time we don't. So we hire character first. And that's a, that makes a difference in how people who are your, become your customers end up relating to you. So um, then how you actually live out your values. So we have an articulated set of mission and vision and values. Mission and vision and values. And that becomes part of your performance appraisal process. Every, you know, you know we're, not, we're not, again, we're hiring, holding people accountable to the best them they can be according to the value system that we embrace as a community. It's very community oriented. Uh, that third uh, word I just used is really, really important. What does accountability mean in your organization? For some people, the easy way out is you're fired. Donald Trump had ultimate accountability in that old TV show, right? You're fired. And, you know, Somehow that didn't, that didn't, it wasn't distasteful to him, but I would just say, as somebody whose primary stewardship responsibility is for the people that are in your flock, these are your, your shepherd, their flock, when you get to the point where you're firing somebody, it's a non-trivial experience in your life. You've got to look at yourself in the mirror before you're ready. You've got to look them in the face when you are ready. And you've got to believe, I think, it's the most loving thing you can do for them to separate so they can become everything God created them to be someplace else because it's clearly not happening where you are in your organization. So those are some of the hallmarks, Doug. I mean, it, it, for me, a lot of it boils down to what you actually do with these great sounding ideas that Todd said. We can, I think most of us can talk the story, the mission, vision, and values, how you live them out, more challenging. What questions do you have? Uh, now, let's we have a microphone, and part of the reason why we want you to use the microphone is for because we're recording this, and so to be able to hear the questions as well as the response. So. Is it working? Okay. No. Uh, you mentioned that you hire for character first, and I was wondering one how you would define good character, and two how you recognize it. Those are great questions because in the interviewing world, especially when you get about fifty people. You actually have federal law and guidelines what you can and can't ask, what you can and can't say in an interview question. So our questioning, uh, our interview process is, you know, we, we will collect all the relevant information on the front end uh, about the, get their, get all their uh, resume material. And we actually now, because of being the size that we got to, we actually we have a formalized process for collecting the allowable information on our that application so we can track it and report that we're not discriminating all these things. Uh, then the actual interviews themselves are, you know, we're, we're geared around, you know, how'd you get here? Well, why, why do you think you want to come here? Uh, tell us about your work experience. And then we'll go down to the next level, which is one of the things when you're not doing, when you're not at work necessarily, but we're just doing whatever you want to do. What, what kinds of things bring you joy? What kinds of things make you happy? We're doing things that are hopefully will allow people to self-disclose to us as well as to themselves. But they do. One of my favorite questions at the end, if somebody's doing really well, they finally get this question. And, and I hired, I was the last interview for everybody up to 150 people in our company, and then I just ran out of the cycles. We had 100 people to hire in a year, ran out of the cycles. So, but I, I was with the last interview. The last interview question for me was this. I had a guy who worked for me for a, a, a long time. He'd come in in the early days, and he was a, Phenomenal analyst, just a great guy. After he'd been there a while, I, he was standing in the lobby area with me in front of the receptionist's desk, and I was bragging to the receptionist about how smart I had been to hire this guy because he had his thumbprints all over everything we were doing. And of course, he stayed there taking it all in. And he, you know, personalities like this, he was completely unfazed. He just looked at me like this great stone face. And I said, Hey, what's the matter with you? He said, Well, there's a problem with your story. I said, Really? What's the problem with my story? He said, Well, you didn't hire me. I said, are you kidding me? I've hired almost everybody that worked here. How do you mean I didn't hire you? I said, no, 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 no. I, I knew I could work for anybody. I hired you. <laughs> I love you. Turn on me. So I asked my candidate, Sydney Fry, that's the story. This, this really happened to me. But I guess I want to know, what are, what are you hiring? What do we need to be so that you can be everything you 
you feel like you're supposed to be as a person, as a professional. What does it look like to you? And then I shut up. Temptation to fill the gap. But that's a, people disclose a lot when they answer that question. So if somebody tells me, as somebody did once, you know, I think I could see myself in your job in five years. And I'm thinking, really, it was that easy? You can do, you can do what I do in five years, really? Um, and some of them probably could. You know, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not great, but at the same time, I'm thinking there's a, there's a level of maturity to that that is, you know, this, they're self-disclosing. Another guy came to me and he said, you know, I don't care what you call me. I don't care what, what my title is. I don't know if I have to supervise it or not. But I know me. I need to be in a place where I can just continue to learn constantly. If I, if I can pick one thing that scares me about going to work and say, I'm going to do the same thing in 10 years that I'm, doing, that I'm going to start doing this year. I, I don't want that. Well, he's self-disclosed. Learning is really important. By the way, I'm in a technology business, software. It, it always changes. It's just constantly changing. So I can say to them, you know what? Let me give you some feedback on that. That's the kind of business we're in. We actually change constantly. We need people who want to learn and learn new things and are self-motivated to do that. The other person I can just say, wow, that's interesting. Thank you very much. <laughs> and so that's kind of what I mean by you hire for character. You're looking for them. That I'm kind of looking for them how well somebody's wrestling with the very question you're wrestling with in this, this particular session. I wonder what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. I want to know what, the, what voices they're listening to that are going to drive their personal satisfaction. I don't believe at the end of the day you can create corporate satisfaction if you have a bunch of employee disengagement or unhappiness within your employee ranks. So a big challenge for us as managers is to create the kind of place where people are becoming everything, everything they were born to be. Since we don't know what that is, we're a big incubator. We're just incubating. But then we're monitoring, following up, feeding back, and helping people be appropriately placed if we're not the right place for uh, My name is Caleb Chin. I have two questions. Uh, one is about the, uh, Bob Bryan and the, who wrote the Royal Lamb. He talked about different uh, professions, different areas, different, uh, we actually need more questions. And uh, he said that all of us just about that, they have not chosen the major today. And you come here and talk to us, well, you need to consider going to this profession this profession and be Christ, the skin nine. What the, are there some areas that you would recommend? And two is, um, actually I forgot the second question, so that maybe I can come back to you. You'll think of it Todd answers this one. Are there any other uh, uh, professions, uh, vocations that you would recommend the uh, questions to go into? What to be the, the ambassador for Christ. Oh. Okay. You start? Okay. Besides business. Besides business. <laughs> yeah, you got to be nuts. <laughs> um, I'm a business professor, so then I, I would love to hear that, but what the, I think, that to be fair, yeah. Uh, all kidding aside, I think, I, 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 personally, I think being a business owner is the only place to be, but that's, that's, that's the shoes that I wear. So. But I, I think, um, from a bigger uh, perspective, um, this is, uh, I, I've said this jokingly to my own kids for a few years now, and unfortunately I think there's some degree of truth in it, there seems to be more truth in it lately. But our kids, you, you young people, need to understand the world, the, the world we operate in. And, and the, I mean, I, I sound like I'm, I'm really on the government today, but in we need good, Christian uh, people in our government systems today. The, the government is playing a bigger role in everything we do. Uh, my personal opinion is they're you know, overstepping their bounds, but uh, uh, but you know if you if outside of business, where you really need to see to, to, for for young people to make an impact and to excel with all the technology. And, and all the things going on out there are, are the government. And I don't mean necessarily go to Washington, D.C. When I speak of the government, I mean uh, teachers, government. I mean, you know, our educational system, again, in my opinion, is just a big bureaucracy. But, 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 but we used to be the envy of the world. And, and our teachers are being asked, and Spring Arbor has a long history of, of teachers, producing teachers, at least in Michigan. And, and uh, uh, 
you know, our teachers are being asked to uh, be more than teachers, be parents practically. You know, and, uh, so uh, to me, uh, the, the, the areas where, where you could, you know, where I, I think we need to uh, grow our youth and, our, and, our, and, and start putting some character back in our lives and a valueless system that we live in is, is, in, the, is in the schools. Um, but really, anywhere, anywhere except for uh, uh, the lawyers. <laughs> or should I say, everywhere, put the lawyers in there. But uh, <laughs> even the lawyers need to be a lot of help. So yeah, I mean, I, I think I think there's a lot that you know that can be done. I need to consider here. My son is a lawyer. <laughs> and one of the good ones. <laughs> Well, um, I think it's an interesting question, uh, what other areas, and I, I think that the answer is wherever God calls you, go, go there and be fully the, the torchbearer that he calls us to be. Education is a field right for it. It's very frustrating. The, the fundamental question is how do you want to change the world? What do you think changes the world? And by the way, how do you eat an elephant? The, the, yeah, one bite at a time. That's right. So the way you change the world is one person at a time. How do you change the world? And so the question is, well, how is God calling me to change the world, even if it's one person at a time? So my dad, for 60 years in the pastoral ministry, really lived this, this dream. He wanted to be the next Billy Graham. So naturally, God put him in small rural churches his entire life. Entire life. Listen, as a business guy, I have spoken in closed Muslim countries to name the name of Christ as the best example of a life of leadership, as the best example of a human being on the planet that has ever lived in a closed country. I've done that in, uh, to, we have a lot of international students come into our community because of the university. So I do this rather routinely with people who are uh, in, the, in the closed countries in the Middle East, Turkey is, not as close, but it's still very, very Muslim dominated. India, uh, very, very uh, dominated by Hindu religion in particular. Um, so you have, you'll have this opportunity, whatever you do, if you build a platform of excellence, let's create a culture of excellence. Why does somebody write a book like that? Uh, create a culture of excellence and be the standard bearer for what does it mean to be truly excellent? It's winsome. It's winsome. And when you see excellence happening in any field, uh, people are drawn to it. And, the, and, the, and when you're drawn to it, then we have a chance to reflect Christ. We have a chance to say, it ain't me. Uh, Matt, why don't you add nothing to add? Okay. I, I have a question for all three of you that kind of goes along with that will. And it's, it's about excellence. And it's also what Todd had said earlier about be the very best you can be and be relevant. I wonder if each of you could share just really practical what that looks like in your lives to be relevant, to be excellent, to be, be the very best you can be. We, we need some practical takeaways today. That's a great question. Um, you know, as a pastor, it's, it's a medium-sized church. Um, I've, I'm the primary like preacher, speaker on the weekends, and so I'll start with that practice for me. Um, I read a lot. I read probably, there's weeks where I read four, four or five books in a week. And so um, just being, and I read a lot of different things from like, you know, like the Christian spirituality stuff to, I just read a couple books last week, Let Your Life Speak, uh, Parker Palmer, was, you know, education. I read um, Talent is Overrated by George Sherrod or whatever. Anyway, but you get my point, just to, to have, to constantly be thinking, um, not just how am I going to use this for a sermon, but to, to be growing myself and um, to have the posture of constantly learning. Um, that's something that for me is, I, I really get energized by just learning things. I've spent the last like nine months um, learning about the stock market and, and I, selling options and derivatives and all that kind of stuff. And so just get super energized by just learning new things that sometimes have zero application to being a pastor. Um, I think about how we're, how we're organized and so some of the stuff that I read and, and I surround myself with people like Will and, and Todd, which helps me improve a lot. Um, you know, Todd is the treasurer on our, on our board, and um, we do, thinking about how we do accounting, for example, as a church, is really important. 
and that stuff bores me to death. Um, <laughs> as an accountant. But it's, it's super important. So because I've surrounded myself with people like, like Todd, who remind me of that, um, you know, we just did an, an internal controls review as a small church, medium-sized church, and every, you know, look at all your controls and how money goes in and out and how, who approves what, and, you know, make sure there's no funny business. And um, I feel really good about that. Just a sense of, hey, we've got this thing buttoned down as well as any organization that, that reviewed us has ever seen before. And so I think that's an important part of being, of being a good steward. It's an important part of, of excellence. So that's just a couple of things, all of these guys. Okay, my, my book can be very short. I, for me, a practical application is action versus words. Just simply stop with the talk and all the buzzwords and all of this and that. And just live your life exactly the way Christ has asked you to live your life, whether it's in business or whatever it is. So much talk these days. Just simply let your yes be yes, your no be no. Let so tell it, stay with that. Tell a story a little bit because you're in manufacturing. So you, you know, it, it wouldn't be what you would describe. It's not the most glamorous, you know, of uh, professions. And so, how do you specifically? Uh, live that out with your employees or tell a story about a specific way that you do that. Very simply, and, and, and this is very serious for me because as Doug said, I do. I have a, a four small a small manufacturing company, so a lot of hands-on stuff. So I end up ultimately dealing directly with a lot of employees. And uh, I, I'm not, uh, uh, for me, uh, as Will has said, each employee is a, res is a responsibility. I care for their success, personally and professionally. If they succeed, I succeed. But along with that, there are relationships. And uh, uh, there are opportunities, and you have to be careful that people aren't taking advantage of you and all these things, but there are opportunities all the time to come alongside people that have committed to me, their careers, to help me build my little piece of the world that have problems, and uh, that were and not just financial problems, emotional problems, struggles, where, where you can take on their burden, and at the end of the day, uh, my goal in life is, or in my profession, is not necessarily to have everybody that's ever worked for me or that works for me say he's the greatest guy in the world and I just love him. That, that doesn't necessarily drive who I am. What does drive me is that at the end of the day they say, you know where he stood and he treated you fair. And when I absolutely needed him, he was there for me. So like, uh, uh, personally, uh, one of the two most influential people in my life, both of those people, by the way, are dead authors. So I don't know what that says about me, but one of my favorite authors <laughs> is C.S. Lewis. And, and Lewis says, you shouldn't you shouldn't aspire for higher virtues until you first committed to be absolutely honest. So if you have absolute honesty as a core uh, as a core value, and you think about what does that mean? And then so a second value that's very near and dear to my heart is the value of stewardship. Stewardship means making the most you can with whatever you can give to do with. Put those two things in, in, into a combination, they lead to excellence. Because you're not gonna let yourself off the hook with a less than excellent performance. You've got to be the best. What's the, we, we, we determined a long time ago we would really do poorly in selling uh, whatever a low, a low quality uh, brand would be today. Back in the day we were, we were selling this, we used to talk about we, we couldn't sell Chevrolet because we would continue to make Cadillacs and be forced to sell another Chevrolet price because it didn't reflect the excellence that we, our staff, and our team personally, we knew we could make it better. We just wanted to make it better, but you got a price for it. So um, the, the the number one thing that came to my mind when you asked the question, I don't know, I've lost you. Where are you? Oh, there you are. Uh, the number one thing that came to my mind is I, I work on a, a campus helping uh, with commercialization activities, and we have a top ten rated entrepreneurship program in our school. 
And our entrepreneurship majors are characterized by people who have broad business backgrounds and zero technical expertise. But they're a lot like I was when I graduated from college. I just had this incredible blessing of getting to go to work for a company, General Motors, that paid for my education in a very technical field, and I became one of the few people in my space could do what I knew how to do. I developed a very specific expertise in that area. And so uh, going into business, I, I just feel like one of the things that's missing today is, is that, that everybody wants to uh, be sitting in chairs on Shark Tank, but they don't actually want to have the expertise to create something to present to Shark Tank. And we need, we need more people who can create and <coughs> innovate. And that's been a fantastic series of creativity and what a God-given gift and responsibility to creativity is. But we need a lot more of that. And to do that, you've got to cultivate the natural gifts, talents, and abilities that you've been given to be able to really do something with excellence and solve a problem in the world. So I don't know if we've been responsive to your question specifically, but hopefully those are some ideas in anyway. A common thing that I would just point out, though, uh, in hearing what Matt said and then uh, knowing more about Todd and his industry, uh, is that he is tenaciously studying different companies and you know where where are places where he can have impact where are places that will produce uh, profit what are systems i mean just really uh very studying in minute detail the systems that occur in the manufacturing process and how can we be more efficient how can we uh, do this in a better way and so that that being said an overarching uh, characteristic that I hear is knowing your field very well, really diving into it and being knowledgeable about whatever area you are pursuing, not just being flippant, kind of sailing through. Uh, you know, if you're a teacher, dive into that. Know exactly that trade, that discipline, study it in great depth, be excellent at that. Um, and it takes time of reading and analysis and getting close to people who are doing it well. So that, that's a common characteristic that I've heard. Another question? We got a couple uh, here in the back, and, um, and I don't know how much time we have, but uh, we'll, uh, I guess we'll take a yeah. couple of questions. Uh, my name is Ina Malitoris, and I'm, I'm the lecturer of the Guinness School of Business. Uh, I'm originally from Ukraine, Kyrgyzstan, and Russia, so I would say from Soviet Union, from Soviet Union. And, uh, mm -hmm. The King School of Business is um, the concept. No, the concept of uh, Spring Harbor University wants us to prepare ourselves and students to be active participants in critical, critically participate in contemporary world. My question is, how would you describe um, uh, the world view of people who are around you, uh, who are you work with? Do they see the world? How far they see the world? What world means for them? What world means for you? Is it uh, limited by Michigan, uh, the United States, or it goes beyond? And what we should do to better prepare our students to see the world, uh, not as a huge mm, uh, place, but small plan? <coughs> So I think that the worldview that the people I work with, and is, I go back to that question of uh, how do you change the world, how do you eat an elephant? And basically you change the world one person at a time. And so the relevancy for us is to take customer uh, interactions and contacts wherever they occur in the world and to, bu to build a relationship. Um, there's a great um, <clears throat> momentum, I guess is the right word, in, in the purchasing cycle of today's companies, it says we want to take out this element of relationship. We want to do it strictly objectively. We're going to buy whatever we purchase strictly objectively. So as we're trying to sell things to people, uh, major airports, major airlines, uh, largest credit companies in the world, the top, the top 100 hospitals uh, in the world, we're trying to sell our products and services to them. They are trying to separate themselves from the, the intangibles. And yet the intangibles are what are going to make them happy. It's kind of silly, but that's what they actually do. The better, the better you are at, at, at 
creating relationships, authentic, authentic relationships, that you can nurture over a long period of time. We have many customers that have been with us for 25 years now, and the reason they'll tell you is they just trust us. And, and we have an opportunity because of them to go overseas. We didn't, in our software business, it's a very kind of American business kind of application, vertical market niche, we didn't try to go international. Our customers dragged us internationally. Our customers said, hey, we're going to go to the UK. Hey, we're going to go to Guatemala. Hey, we're going to go to Venezuela. Hey, will you go with us? We said, well, we set up, we set up I don't know how many data centers we set up in India now for on behalf of our customers. Uh, and the reason is because it's relationship. So we think that building the relationship is still extremely important in spite of this momentum that you're going to sense in the marketplace <coughs> of trying to objectify decision making to get away from the good old boy network or gross overspending for something that shouldn't have cost that much in the beginning. But at the end of the day, it is your relationship. And as Matt, I think what Matt said this morning is really true, we are trying to listen to the voice inside of us, even though the voices out there are telling us different things. And in that authenticity, people sense, that's different. We, we did a, a, it's a little bit of a long story. We did a, a, moved into a new facility, re rehabilitated a large shopping center, and put all of our people into one facility in, in, our, in our Muncie location for the first time in 10 years. And we invited all of our customers to come, and we had a user conference to come up and see us. And we have our statement of corporate philosophy and our values uh, for ourselves internally. We have it on our own internal wall. We don't sit out there Internally, we have that. I caught a customer staring at our statement of corporate philosophy, which says, we believe Jesus Christ is the best example of life of good stewardship that ever existed. It's his example we're going to try to follow. And this lady's standing there looking at it, saying, oh, it all makes sense now. She didn't know I heard her, but I was behind her. I said, Marcia, how you doing? Great. What do you mean it all makes sense now? And she said this, there's something different about your company that we could always knew was there, but we didn't know what it was. Now I understand it. So you just you hope and pray for those opportunities when somebody says, "Oh, what made you different?" We say, "Well, you know, really, it's not us. We're trying to live up to a different standard. These standards are really high, but, but we find that we're happier when we do that. So that's what we're trying to do: build relationships. I think that's the worldview we, we see most often." Just add to that, um, the, how do you expand your worldview? Uh, I love the, your brief background. Um, I think, um, I, I mentioned this when I was here last spring or whatever, but when I graduated from undergraduate, I took like a year to, to backpack around the world. I went to like 30-some 30, 30 countries. Yeah, and just experienced different people and places and cultures. And, um, and one of the things that happens is you realize the world is pretty small. In a lot of ways, and people are pretty much people uh, wherever you go. And so, I don't know how you necessarily, other than encouraging people to do things that expand their, you know, their experience and their horizons. I think. Um, so yeah, I think, that's, I think that's important. We have time for one more question. And Todd, if, yeah, are you going to follow up? Maybe uh, I'm gonna... You're the boss. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead with the question. Um, my name is Becca Mason, and I'm a student here in the Ganey School of Business. And my question is, we've, you've talked a lot about um, once you're a manager and what that looks like in the professional field. Uh, most of us aren't going to graduate and get hired in as managers right away. So how do we, um, as those people that are supporting the managers, how do we do that for them? How do we support them? And how do we um, be professional ministers in these fields before we're in a managerial role with a lot of um, clout and of actual like power. Uh, one of my favorite authors is Will Davis from, from One of the things in his uh, book, Creating a Culture of Excellence, and he won't tell you about this because he's honest, but I will. But one of the things that he talks about is when you work for General Motors, uh, uh, I, the, he was he, in part part of this book. He's explaining what his work life and his culture was like when he was at General Motors. And he, he, he writes in the book, uh, you better look out at 5 o'clock. If you're not careful, you're going to get trampled if you're in the way of the door. I mean, so you guys get all that. So to answer your question, you're right. You know, I think it's a great point. You know, um, most kids, most young people nowadays want to start out up here on top of the ladder. And, and, uh, well, 
Uh, one of the things for me is, and it sort of gets back to what Will was talking about earlier, uh, but to take a di different look at it, is passion. Uh, business owners see passion. They see the young people that are, are, are committed or not committed. And to, to get noticed or to get recognized, again, show the passion. Don't be the first guy out the door at 501. Don't be the first guy, the, the guy in the lunchroom preaching how good you are and how many hours you worked and how much you got done. Just do your job. You'll get noticed. The world is vicious out there today. Us people that are in positions of managers or business owners, we're looking for people to get jobs done to accomplish tasks, and you'll be rewarded quickly. I think it's a great question. I appreciate your insightfulness uh, to ask it. Uh, the, the, I think that the, the truth is all of us started, I started out as a teller in a bank, started out as a lowest level engineer. I argued with him when I went to work there. I said, you don't have to pay me that much, really, because that's like 40% more than the banks pay me. They said, you don't understand, sir. If you don't make at least that much money, you're not good enough to be here. I said, really? I came to the right place, because I know I'm worth more than that. Um, <laughs> You go into it and, and you, you just do the best, be the best you you can be. This this whole message of the day seems to be playing pretty well. Be the best you you can be everywhere you go. Serve other people's best interests in the long term. Uh, make it a point to be an encourager and be one who's there. My my first job out of college, I was I was hired. I knew I was going to be eventually given the job as the accounting supervisor, but I didn't start out there. I started out as a teller and I went around and originated loans and opened savings accounts. I have every job in the bank so that when I got the paperwork on that in accounting, I'd know what to do with it, know where it came from, know what the thought was behind it. So I'm starting through the process of becoming the, 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 the accounting expert as well. I'm doing that by learning all the desks in the, in the accounting department. And uh, did I mention I don't like accounting? Uh, I didn't like accounting. Anyway, uh, doing all this, 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 what's really bookkeeping work, and I've, my, my coworkers were slow to want to change. They've been doing it one of them 30 years. The least, the least seniority person in the department been there seven years. Predictably, she thought she should have been given and, and I didn't have any control over that. But I went to my, 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 the guy who's my supervisor, the treasurer of the bank. I said, you know, I think you should make me the, the accounting supervisor now. Give me the title now. He said, why is that? I said, well, because I don't feel like I have the authority to tell people what they are to ask them to do things differently. He said this insightful thing to me, which is really, really helpful. He said, you know, uh, you will know when you're ready to become the accounting supervisor, take that next promotion that you're going to get at some point early in your career because you ask good questions. Um, we'll know when you're ready for that job by the fact that the group will already have made you their supervisor. So how, how will I know that's happening? He says, when they start asking you the questions, you'll be their supervisor. When you know enough to help other people become everything they can be, you're having trouble with that? Maybe, you know, I, I could probably help you with that. Let me, when you know enough to be able to help people with that, it turns out that you're serving their best interests in the long term. And one thing I, I do a little thing on leadership, and, and I don't know if this is in the book or not, but leadership is a terrible goal. To strive to be a leader, you're almost always destined to fail. If you strive to be a servant, you'll be thrust into leadership. You'll be thrust into leadership if you just strive to serve other people's best interests long term. Right. Great question. What is it your boss and your coworkers need? And then go and meet that. We need to close our time here. Uh, I appreciate uh, your willingness to, by, to be present during this time. I think they're willing to stay after. If you have individual questions for them, uh, they would welcome that. But let's show our appreciation to them.